to hear a revolution in talk radio. Liberty Talk Radio, where the critical thinking will defrag your mind of propaganda-ridden viruses induced by mass media news programming. No BS here, just the facts. And now we present to you America's quintessential iconoclastic anomaly. Wow. In talk radio, your host, Joe Cristiano. Welcome, everyone, to Liberty Talk Radio. I'm your host, Joe Cristiano. We're broadcasting from our studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to around the world. This is your libertarian voice and your antidote to popular talk radio. Uh, today, we are honored that Professor Lawrence Kutlikoff has accepted our invitation to be on our show. He is a William Fairfield Warren professor and a professor of economics at Boston University, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research, president of the Economic Security Planning, Inc., and the director of the Financial Analysis Center. Professor Kutlikoff is also a New York Times bestselling author and active columnist, which has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and many other major publications. In addition, he is a frequent guest and on, on major television and radio programs. In 2014, he was named by The Economist as one of the world's 25 most influential co- economists. Uh, he is with us today to discuss his latest book, Get What's Yours, The Secrets of Maxing Out Your Social Security. Uh, please call us with your questions and comments during our live broadcast, 646-652-4620, and press the one button so we know that you want to be placed on the air and ask a question or make a comment. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, now, uh, Mr. Kotlikoff, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, um, we're, we're adjusting our volumes. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you so much for being on our program. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having yeah, me. I know your time is very valuable and very limited, and I, we really appreciate your taking the time. Um, we had Andy Sutton on last week, and he asked me to extend his regards to you. Uh, of course, he's an economist, and he's a regular on our program. Um, and, uh, and he adds uh, uh, volumes to, to the knowledge base for our uh, listeners. Well, we're here to discuss the uh, Social Security program. Uh, I'd like to preface this by saying um, I'm 72 and a half years old. And, uh, you know, when I applied for Social Security, I thought this was the most plain vanilla thing you can ever do in your life. You either took Social Security when you were 62 or 65 or 66 then at that time and uh, you filled out a form uh, and you went about your business and that was that there was no more to it and there was no less to it and I was a happy camper I thought I did everything you know according to Hoyle and I did everything properly and I maximized my uh, uh, my income by filing at 62 rather than uh, 66 rather than 62 Man, did I, did I feel smart. Well, you sent me your book, Get What's Yours, and I'll show it here for the, uh, our, our listeners, The Secrets to maxim- uh, Maximizing Your Social Security uh, with Philip Moeller and Paul Solomon. And um, uh, when I first received this book, I, I thought, oh, my God, a manual, you know, on the how to, how could I ever get through this? And I was so pleasantly surprised that it was not only incredibly informative, uh, unfortunately embarrass- embarrassing for me because I made so many mistakes, but it is, um, it's, it's interesting, well-written, and entertaining at the same time. So I was able to wade through most of your book, <laughs> believe it or not. And... Uh, this is truly a how-to manual, and if you don't, the, the nice part about this book is if you don't understand aspects of it, there are ways for you to determine how to get the answers, questions that you would, would never pose if you did not read this book. And boy, was I a big loser by thinking that everything was so simple by just signing up and going home and it took me 15 minutes and I was a happy camper so thank you for thank you for destroying my life and making me feel like a dunce by the way <laughs> after reading this book <laughs> sorry. yeah sorry uh, I'm trying to get to you sooner that's um a lot of people have uh I, I, you you took your benefit at what what age 66 66 mm-hmm 
Yeah. Had you waited until 70, you could have uh, gotten a 32% higher check every month. I, I Believe me, um, I learned that in, know, in the first two chapters. <laughs> I learned that very clearly. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, at the time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still working. I'm 72 and a half, as I say. And uh, remember when you were a kid, you said, how old are you? They say four and a half, you know. And I decided I'm going to be a kid again. I'm not going to say 72. I'm going to say 72 and a half. I want to revert back. But um, uh, 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 at that time, well, I'm still working. And I, I have my my studio. I own a couple of companies. I'm busy all day long. And to me, this was just something that I had to get done because I had to get done. Uh, it was a little a minor consequence to me, and it still is, you know. But I'm sort of annoyed at myself that, you know, there was nothing brought forward to me saying, hey, before you apply, here are the 20 questions that you should answer. And I, it, they may be available, but I never even bothered to look. And I'm sure most people do the same thing. Yeah, the uh, the system is incredibly complicated. It's got 2,728 rules in the handbook of social, social security, and it's got hundreds of thousands of rules about those rules in its program operating manual system. It's about as complicated a system as bureaucrats could ever devise. So, you know, we've got a, a nightmare, a user nightmare in place, and the... Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a terrible way to treat the American public when it comes to their most important retirement resource. It's just unbelievable that, uh, that it's gotten to this point where you need to have a best-selling book to actually get people to, um, uh, uh, to get what's theirs. And that's why we're at this book called Get What's Yours, The Secrets to Maxing Out Your Social Security. And I wrote it with uh, two co-authors, Phil Muller, who's a long-term personal finance columnist, and Paul Solomon, who's a uh, PBS NewsHour economics correspondent for many decades now. So I don't know, somehow the writing style worked between three uh, people with different backgrounds, and it became a bestseller. It's still, I don't think it's a bestseller this week, but it, it was for about uh, six months, or so, eight months, actually. Uh, this went off the list. So, you know, I... Uh, there's, there's a lots of, of issues here. Uh, the general rule for how to maximize your lifetime benefits, your Social Security benefits, it, the three rules that we postulate. One is to be patient because if you wait till 70 compared to taking your retirement benefit at 62, and almost everybody takes their retirement benefit before 66, before the current full retirement age, that's about 80% of the people do that. Uh, if you wait from 62 to 70, you're going to collect a 76% higher check for every year that you're alive, every month you're alive from age 70 on. And we have to think about Social Security as um, a protection, as an insurance system that's trying to protect you against living to a very old age. So the worst case scenario is you live to 100 in terms of your finances. And Social Security... Uh, by letting you get a much higher benefit, very much higher benefit in waiting, it's really letting you buy insurance at a very low price because giving up benefits for eight years, low benefits in order to get much higher benefits is really kind of paying a price for those higher benefits. And uh, they continue just until you die, so right until when you die. So you can live to 120, they'll still be there. Anyway, so the first rule is to be patient. The second rule it's to understand all your benefits. Social Security has about 10 different benefits that one can collect or either immediately or in the future, depending on one's circumstance. There's benefits for children. There's benefits for spouses looking after children, young children. There's benefits for disabled children. There's benefits for the disabled. There's benefits for widows and widowers and divorcees uh, and for even for parents if you're taking care of them before you die. Uh, so you need to know about all your benefits. And then the third rule is you need to be strategic about when you take uh, your benefits because if you take two benefits at once, Social Security will just give you the larger of the two. So the, the, one of the tricks to maximizing your lifetime benefits is to take a low benefit, a first, uh, one of the two benefits that you can collect early and then let the other one grow and then take it. 
So right. it could be you take your widow's benefit first and then you take your retirement benefit or the other way around, depending on your circumstance, or you could take a, if you wait till full retirement age, you can take your spouse benefit early. I mean, sorry, just, just your spouse benefit between full retirement age and 70 and then take your highest possible retirement benefit. So there are strategies the book lays out for how to maximize your lifetime benefits. And then um, my company has a software, I've got a software company on the side I'm a BU professor, as you mentioned, and at MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com, we have a program that uh, can help people find out exactly what they should do uh, in terms of maximizing their benefits. Uh, we come up with the uh, suggestions for how to do that. So, and we can, you know, the program is very smart. and can, In some cases, it has to go through 30,000 options or 100,000 options or even a million options to figure out what's what's best because you've got two very interconnected uh, issues here, decisions, sets of decisions if you're dealing with spouses because what one spouse can do depends on what the other spouse can do, does, and vice versa. So there's a simultaneity in this decision. Anyway, so uh, those are the three general rules. Be patient, know about all your benefits, and be strategic about when you collect them. Time your collection very properly. And it can mean big bucks uh, if you're a very high earning couple uh, who's now age 60 optimizing your lifetime benefits doing the thing the right thing at the right time to mean an extra four hundred thousand dollars and it's perfectly safe all it involves is going to social security and asking for whatever it is you're supposed to ask for at the right time uh, and not just going in there at age 62 as early as possible and grabbing the benefits because would be much lower than uh, they'd otherwise be. Oh, yeah. I've known many people in my family who have done that, and I never thought anything of it. I said, well, you know, they want to take a 62, fine. I said, I didn't need the money, so I'll wait till 66. I've got a little bit more. And that's about all, th that's the entire thought process that, that went into it. Um, it. It's astounding, the mistakes that I made. I recall when I sat down with the Social Security uh, clerk, uh, she said, well, how come you had no salary back when back in 1991 92 something like that i said well i was building a business at the time and i was taking all of my resources and putting it back into the business i was opening up audiology offices for my wife now we had money but i didn't wouldn't take any income i was plowing into the business i'm glad i did because it it helped you know helped us through the hard times and whatever when you're starting a new new business enterprise I gave absolutely no thought to the fact that those two years were going to reduce my uh, Social Security benefits. I may have made a different decision at that time, but I didn't know that, and I'll bet 99% of the public has no idea that that's going to affect their, their future income. In fact, I'll bet 99% of the public doesn't even know what affects their future uh, uh, income with Social Security, that they, they were as numb as I was thinking that, you know, at 66, you got a certain amount because of your age and the fact that you worked all your life. And that was the end of that. Social Security could be written on probably one half of one page, all of the terms and conditions. And that was it. That was my perception. And when I saw the complexity of it, I realized that Social Security was not a retirement, but was an entire welfare program in, in a sense. Well, it's, you know, we've been paying 12.4% of our uh, pay to Social Security from uh, age 16 on till the present. Right. And that's a long, long time. And we're paying for a lot of different benefits. So uh, I'm not sure we should call it a welfare program per se. It's, I agree. Um, the, the rich actually have more to gain from optimizing the social security than the poor in terms of absolute dollar amounts. Right. The, um, so there's all kinds of redistribution going on. Some of it's from the poor to the rich. Uh, some of it's from the rich to the poor. Uh, it's just, a, it's really a disgrace because it's so complicated and nobody in Congress really understands the monster they've created over decades. And then in addition to uh, the, um, system being so complicated uh, for users to understand and, and uh, that's problem number one problem number two is that the people at social security the good folks at social security are sure they understand the system backwards and forwards but they are in 
they're often, I would say, 40% of the time giving you either absolutely the wrong answer to questions, they, or they give you misleading or incomplete information. So that's uh, a big problem. And the third thing is the system is $26 trillion in the red. It's in the hole, according to the trustees report that was uh, issued by the Social Security trustees in July. The system is 32% underfinanced. It's in far worse shape than the, than the Detroit pensions when they went under. Uh, you know, by the way, uh, as we're talking, I finally got into Skype. So in case you want to switch over to Skype, I think we can do it at well, this wait, point. What we can I've do been, is, uh, can we, hold on a second, please. Uh, can we do that during our break, you think, Preston? I'm asking our board operator. Yeah, how about we do this? We, we're going to take a break in about uh, in a few minutes, just a real quick one-minute break. And during that break, we can convert over. Sure. How about that? Okay? All right. Now, okay, you know, great. L- yeah. let me say this. When I went to the Social Security Administration, one thing I was really surprised at is that they were incredibly helpful, incredibly pleasant. Um, it, it was it was not like going to a government agency. I mean, I, I went there expecting, you know, fill out this form, go to table number three and get out, you know. But the woman was very helpful. She was kind. I mean, I, it was a pleasant experience. But the problem was not her. The problem was me. I didn't know what questions to ask because I just thought I had to sign this paper and leave. And I'm just so frustrated that I didn't know that there was – no one ever said, Joe, you better study up on Social Security or, or you're going to lose out or you're not going to file properly. You're not going to do the right thing. I would have done so many things so differently, but I was totally ignorant. How did a program that was supposed to be so simple, uh, because when back in the old days, most people had physical jobs. They worked in factories and foundries. And at the age of 62, they were generally worn out. And so people took their, uh, their life expectancy was much lower. They were tired. Their bones were hurting and whatever, like they are to, for me today. And um, uh, uh, so you can see where, you know, at that time they would get some supplemental insurance, especially when they've been paying in for a good number of years. How did it go from something very simple like that to this massive distribution program and assistance program that so many aspects of it have absolutely nothing to do with the Social Security as I perceived it all these years. Well, I guess you could call it mission creep. They just kept adding, you know, benefits through time and adjusting the system. And I, th- I think the a lot of this has to do with um, the bureaucrats who are actuaries uh, just loving the details uh, and trying to make a system that... Um, uh, that they think is beautiful, but nobody can understand. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's actually a separate real, really there's a separate language associated with Social Security. You need to understand that language even to read their uh, uh, their handbook or their program operating manual system. And you have, and it takes years to learn their language. And that's what, um, since I was um, making sure that our software, uh, Maximize My Social Security uh, at MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com was, accurate i had to learn all these rules and then i started writing a, a column for pbs news hour uh, each, each week about answering social security questions so i was in a position uh, together with paul and uh, and phil to write this book and the, the reason we got the book going is that i made fifty thousand dollars for paul in about two minutes over in the middle of a tennis game we kind of stopped and started talking about his uh, decisions about social security and he was fifty thousand dollars richer after two minutes. I made one hundred twenty thousand dollars for a friend, Glenn Lowry, who's a professor at Brown, who knew nothing about widower benefits. Wow. And I made uh, thirty thousand dollars for another friend uh, who had children. And he knew nothing about child benefits. So, you know, when Paul started hearing about all these examples, uh, he and I decided we time to write a book. And we got so involved, and that's um, how Get What Yours got started. Yeah, about the only thing that I did half correct was the fact that I did not start it at 62, I started at 66. I didn't even know there was an option to wait till 70. I mean, the my abject ignorance, I, I should admit this, I mean, it, it was so bad because I, I'm so busy, I never gave it any thought. I thought it was just an automatic program. You walked in, they well, stamped your yeah, name, and, Joe, and, you know, and that's, that's, that. really their, that's really their their fault, Joe. They should have told you when you came in 
you had these other options, and here's the trade-off. Uh, you know, I, I blame this on not on you at all. You're an innocent victim. Um, this was uh, Social Security's uh, mistake. The people there are just so poorly trained. They're also uh, in this mindset that if you don't take your benefits early, you could die and lose them. Now think about that. Yeah. If you die, are you going to regret not having collected your Social Security benefits? I don't think so. You're going to be dead. You're going to be in heaven. You're going to be. <laughs> right. You'll have all the money in the world, right? Right. The real issue, uh, and and it's because actuaries have been running the system uh, that they got people into that kind of mindset. And they indeed they used to systematically tell people to take their benefits early because they would lose them if they died. And they, uh, I have a friend who they actually screamed at when he said, "No, I don't want to do this." They, the lady at the office started yelling at him in a very loud voice. Uh, insisting that he was making a huge mistake, not taking his benefits early. This is, and they would to this day continue to be doing that. I sat down with a chief actuary of Social Security, Steve Goss, and I had to explain to him that this is, you know, pardon my my language here, ass backwards. That the Social Security is insurance. People are not; they don't have a thousand lives to die. Uh, they're not going to die a thousand times. They're going to die once, and it could be at age 100. So right. you have to cover your worst case scenario, just like we have catastrophic insurance for health, or we have, you know, we cover a complete destruction of our house through a fire. You have to buy worst case scenario here, which in this case is to wait. Uh, that's how you get the maximum uh, uh, coverage from the system for the catastrophic event that you live to 100. And so they screwed up your thinking because they didn't tell you the right thing, and they they were focused on your taking benefits early at the time you went. Right. Uh, we really uh, taken the private sector really to turn things around and how people think about longevity risk. Uh, it's just people have got this completely screwed up in their brains about how to think about longevity. They're all everybody's sure they're going to die early because we don't want to jinx ourselves thinking we're going to live a long right. time. Right. And right. consequently, psychologically, we we're, we're oriented toward taking our money early. And uh, right, and that's not the right move. And and by the way, you know, if you wait to collect, and your widow will have a higher benefit because you waited. If uh, she's able to, he or she or, uh, is able to collect on your record. Right. So well, um, yeah. you know, if, they, if they're otherwise going to have higher benefits on their own record, it won't matter. But um, in most cases, women earn less than men in marriages, and uh, so waiting to until 70 means your widow ends up with a bigger benefit if you pass away before she does. Yeah. Well, my wife just applied for Social Security just a few months ago, and uh, she said, what do I do? I said, well, you just wait till 66, go down to the office and sign a paper, and that's it. I mean, <laughs> I told her everything I knew about no, wait, Social wait, wait. Security. <laughs> when did she do this? Uh, when she, did your wife do yeah, she, When did she do this? She, about uh, four months ago, four or five months ago. Five did she apply ago. for her own benefit, or did she? Does she have a working, uh, an earning? Oh yes, yeah, yes, absolutely, earning yeah, history? yeah. She's an audiologist, yeah. Okay, yeah. did she apply, Joe? Did she apply for her own benefit or her a own, spousal yeah. benefit on your record? Oh no, just just her own. What did she do? She's an audiolo audiologist in private practice. Okay, so she applied for a benefit based on her own her own earnings record. That's correct. Okay, now here's what you have to do, Joe. We're going to save you. We're going to make you about fifty thousand bucks right now. In the next minute. I'm, okay. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm ecstatic at this point. <laughs> what, what did you say? I said I'm ecstatic at this point. Go ecstatic? on, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, what your wife needs to do is to go back to Social Security and withdraw her retirement account filing. She needs to withdraw her her retirement benefit yeah and that's the word she needs to use withdrawal not suspend withdrawal it's a very important difference okay. okay she has to file and she has to pay back the four months of benefits she's received okay but at the same time she has to and they're going to be gross of any medicare deductions uh, or any tax withholding so the gross check that she's going to be asked to re repay okay now at the same time she has to, she wants to file just for a spousal benefit based on your work record Okay. And she will collect and retroactive to when she became 66, and she can do that. Okay. So she will not have lost any of her spousal benefits. She's going to get half of your 
full retirement benefit, not your age. Yeah, well, you, you took your benefit at full retirement age anyway. So yes, she's going to get right. half of your full retirement benefit uh, up through age 70. And then at 70, she's going to collect her own retirement benefit. She's going to okay, go back I, and say, I'd like my retirement benefit. Now, I that's going to make that. her in present value an extra 50, you guys, an extra 50,000 bucks. This is exactly the situation that Paul was in. Uh, uh, he well, he and his wife were both going to wait till seventy and knew nothing about spousal benefits. Yeah, but right. your wife can collect a spousal benefit, a full spousal benefit, but she can't do it if she's also collecting her retirement benefit because they'll just give her the larger of the two benefits, which will be her retirement benefit. Right. Nor can she do what I'm saying if she suspends her retirement benefit because even if she takes her retirement benefit and suspends it, they'll still. Uh, treat her as if she's collecting two benefits at once. So it's very important that she withdraw her benefit, repay, and then at the same time file just for a spouse benefit retroactive All right. age 66. I, I'm going to write that down. And, and, and the, the just, term that she uses is what? She, she She's going to withdraw and suspend? Is that the magic words? No, no, no. Dinette, tell, tell her never to mention the word suspend. And before oh, she oh, goes uh, in, you should she should write down in black and white exactly what she wants to have done and have them sign her statement that here's what I want to have done. I want to withdraw my retirement benefit. I want to repay immediately all the benefits that I've received okay. uh, on uh, all the retirement benefits I've received. I also want to file retroactively just for my spousal benefit. I want to restrict I want to file a restricted app an application that's restricted just to my spousal benefit retroactive to when I was age 66, which was yeah. About four months, and uh, then she, and she'll receive so, all the money back uh, that 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 was due her from the time that she was eligible for this. Then, so she won't lose that much money in the deal. All, yeah. Wow! Unbelievable. Right. She'll receive unbelievable. all the spousal benefits uh, back to age sixty-six, and uh, yeah, you you know, she your your cash flow from Social Security will be smaller for the next four years, but her benefit is going to start. 32 percent higher at age 70 as a result right i understand that yeah and well, oh boy yeah oh. you know may, maybe i i um uh decided to stop my social security at 66 because i thought maybe my wife was going to kill me in my sleep you know who knows <laughs> no we actually get along uh, very well, well. <laughs> yeah if she was going to kill you she should have had you wait because uh <laughs> get a higher risk benefit. That's right. Okay. You, okay. You should wait until you're 70 to kill you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then, then I have to start worrying, right? Okay. If the, you could just hold our on. Book is very clear about when to kill your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I move out. I'll let you know. Okay, if you could hold on for one minute, we need to okay. stop for station identification. We'll be right back. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Hold on, please. Okay. Here, we're going to try to Skype. So maybe you guys can call me on the Lawrence Kotlikoff. You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Political talk derived from a historical perspective. Not always palatable, but good food for thought. Pure libertarian talk with host Joe Cristiano. LibertyTalkRadio.com Express Test is your go-to company for on-site occupational health testing services. That's right. We sit on-site. That means we will meet you at your facility for a free health and occupational safety consultation. Express Test specializes in hearing conservation, respiratory protection, and employee safety. We can help you establish viable programs tailored to your business and employee needs. For your free consultation, call 918-743-2929 or visit us at expresstest.com. That's 918-743-2929 or expresstest.com. Do you find yourself asking, what did you say? Aaron Cristiano of Ranch Acres Audiology has over 25 years of experience helping patients just like you. Hearing requires conservation. We need to be aware and we need to be responsible for our own hearing health. Understand more with a little help from Ranch Acres Audiology. Call 918-749-7711. That's 918-749-7711 to learn more. 
We'd like to thank attorney Constance Squires for her support of Liberty Talk Radio. If you want a comprehensive way to affordably avoid legal issues, call Constance Squires. For a free consultation, call 918-254-9283 or go online at isthywilldone.com. Steve Harden of the Harden Insurance Agency has over 30 years of experience designing family insurance protection, including retirement planning. Call 918-488-0024 or go to hardenagency.com and request a free in-depth estate and retirement evaluation. We look forward to earning your trust and helping you meet your life goals. This isn't your typical talk radio show. This is Liberty. Liberty Talk Radio. Well, Hi, folks, we have uh, Professor Kotlikoff. Uh, uh, we're trying to get him on the line on the uh, on Skype on uh, on the video, so that we can uh, continue our conversation. We've been talking about the uh, Social Security, his book, The Secrets of Maxing Out Your Social Security. Get what's yours, and it's amazing the mistakes that I made when I filed Hello. and the advice that I gave my wife, and and we're squaring this all away, and he's telling me what what to do. I have to refile and and make things right, and I guess uh, it, it it's something I should do to maximize the Social Security the way it was intended to be. Unfortunately, we're not schooled in this. You know, no one knows. Uh, everyone says you just file for Social Security at 62 or 65, uh, 62 or 66 or 70, whatever. I just thought that you had two two dates and that was it and it is a lot more complicated his entire book it's get what's yours the secrets to maximizing your social security is a fabulous book uh it's not only comprehensive um informative but it's entertaining at the same time and it, it it's uh, co-written with philip moeller and paul solomon and they have sections in here with questions and answers and segments that answer your questions specifically um oh, do we have him on the line yeah, now the okay uh i don't see him on the screen oh he no because he's not on uh, he's just on the blog talk Oh, yeah, we, 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 we could not get, all right, I'm sorry, we could not get you on Skype. We're sorry about that. We don't know why the pro- we're having a problem, but me, we're having a problem. Me too, I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you okay. why it's happening. The, the problem is that Microsoft, because they took over Skype and nothing works now. Oh, okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's a nightmare. So we know oh. why. All right, now, I'm, uh, I'm going to change the tide of this conversation a little bit because I, I, I always associated you with the national debt. I know you've talked a lot about the national debt, and you're a guru in in that regard. And so uh, if everyone uh, uh, applied for Social Security and uh, 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 used all of the uh, aspects of Social Security, which is legally theirs, what would happen to our debt? Would it go up? And if so, how much? And would we go bankrupt that much sooner? If if everybody, when you said liquidated, uh, well, let me let me put it this way: the country's got uh, about thirteen trillion dollars of debt in the hands of the public. The GDP of the country is about eighteen trillion. Right, eighteen point so five almost. That's right. a pretty big big number, you would think. But almost all the true obligations of the federal government are off the books. Uh, think about the Social Security benefits you're collecting, Joe, for the rest of your life. None of those checks that you're going to get every month, which are true obligations by the federal government to you, are recorded as part of the official debt. And the reason they're not recorded is just a matter of choice. They chose not to put them on the books, just like Enron decided to put keep liabilities off the books. It's really no different. How do you think Enron learned how to do its accounting? They learned it from Congress. So <laughs> all the Social Security liabilities, all the Medicare liabilities, all the Medicaid liabilities, all the Medicaid all the liabilities to paying for defense spending for the rest of time, through time, all the obligations to pay for the president's lunch and and to gas up Air Force One, none of these things are on the books. So if you look at all the spending obligations, including servicing the official debt, paying interest and uh, principal (coughs) on the debt, (coughs) and then um, you compare that with with all the taxes that are projected to come in, and the Congressional Budget Office has projections out 
75 years and you want to easily extend those. Uh, so they, the CBO <clears throat> made these, uh, this is our government agency, made these projections back in July. And if you look at all the, all the expenditure commitments and you compare them with all the taxes, the difference in present value is $199 trillion. So our true debt is, is $200 trillion. We're short, not $13 trillion, but $200 trillion. That's the kind of right. obligation that we've left to our children. And we have politicians running around the country saying we should cut taxes uh, with, without mentioning anything about the $200 trillion fiscal gap that we're facing or increased spending. So uh, you got people on the right and the left, <clears throat> all of whom are engaging in, uh, in what I call a war on our children, a fiscal war on our children, because we already are leaving an absolutely horrendous obligation to our kids, and they want to make it bigger. And this is, you know, we got to this point uh, by running a take-as-you-go policy for decades. Take from the kids, give to older people, right. and tell the kids, don't worry, we're going to give you yours when you're older, or you'll get a chance to rip off your kids when you're older. Right. <laughs> and <clears throat> this is, in effect, a, a Ponzi scheme that's been right. ongoing for decades. And it uh, it leads to this fiscal gap, <clears throat> has led to this fiscal gap of of enormous proportions, so we would need to have a 58% immediate and permanent tax cut to get rid of the, f the fiscal gap in present value. In other words, for the rest of time, we need to get 58% more revenue if we want to spend all the money that the CBO says the government has in mind to spend. And this is under relatively uh, conservative assumptions. They're making the projections uh, are not <clears throat> super aggressive with respect to what they're assuming. I think, if anything, they're understating the obligation. So. So that's the, the problem. We have um, a country that's basically broke, not basically, just absolutely is broke. Uh, the politicians have uh, been disguising that fact. And I'm not even sure they understand it themselves because right. uh, how many of these, how many, you know, does Bernie Sanders actually understand uh, the fiscal gap? I, I testified to him a few months ago at the Senate Budget Committee and uh, <clears throat> I tried to explain this to him. He seemed to have no interest whatsoever in understanding the true fiscal position of the country. I don't think that uh, that many of the Republicans have much interest either in understanding it. Some do. John Kasich, for example, was budget uh, chairman, House Budget Committee chairman uh, for many years when he was in Congress. And he understands about fiscal gap accounting. He understands how bad the situation really is. Uh, but I think he's the only only candidate out there that really even understands the concept, even has heard the word fiscal gap, apart from Sanders, who didn't seem to want to pay any attention to it. He thought I was a Republican because I had been invited by the Republicans to testify. So he decided I was the enemy from one, from the first minute on, even though I said, look, you know, last time I was here, I was invited by Bill Bradley, who's a Democrat, and uh, to the Senate Finance Committee to discuss our fiscal situation. That was decades ago. And... I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm just an economist, and here's the fact. We're $200 trillion in the red, and uh, no real interest uh, in that conversation. So I don't know what to say about um, the future of this country if we're going to uh, leave our kids with that kind of uh, fiscal burden. In addition, we've got, you know, I, I view all this as kind of running a war on our children an That's undeclared correct, yeah. war, and I'm, I think That's it's correct. time for Congress to just openly declare war on our children, because if you look at the educational system, education we're not giving our kids, if you look at the fiscal liabilities we're leaving our kids, if you look at the climate we're um, likely to be um, leaving our children, and you see these super storms happening uh, to, you know, yesterday in South Carolina, uh, you know, <laughs> somebody <laughs> said this was like the end of time, end of, end of day storm that they've never seen anything like the kind of water that came down. Um, you know, if you look at the, the wars that we've been waging without any real thought about where we're going with those wars and, and, uh, and, and whether it, it really matters if we let our children die and get maimed for the rest of their lives um, without any clear objective or strategy, you know, it just, it's on, or if you look at what's what's going on with Iran and, and leaving the Iranians uh, with, a, with a very high likelihood of getting a nuclear weapon and leaving the Koreans with a nuclear weapon who are now developing long-range missiles, 
uh, all these things are endangering our children to a very terrible degree. So I view that as as waging war on our children. I think it's time for Congress to openly declare war on our children uh, because the Constitution says that they need to declare war when we're at war. And this is our, our enemy, apparently, our children. So right. it's, you know, obviously this is, um, I'm not a crazy person, so I'm not suggesting this other than as a means of trying to clarify how serious the situation is uh, and and we all need to understand uh, that uh, we we can't trust these politicians if they're not going to talk about the truth if they're not going to if they're going to get up and say let's just raise more spending and and cut taxes and we, we've already got 199 trillion dollar fiscal gap uh, they're just not on this planet well you know i i get a, i have occasion to speak to young people and i love doing that Unfortunately, when I talk about this, basically what you've just said, uh, they look at me like, I've never heard this before. I mean, why aren't parents screaming about this for their kids? If parents care about their children, why aren't they concerned? Why aren't they telling their children, we, you've got a problem, you know, Johnny, um, you, you're not going to make it. But what we do is we continue this facade and then we allow them to go to college, graduate with a, a $73,000 debt, you know, in which they can't find a job because they have a degree in worthlessness. I mean, it seems that the parents are as ignorant or uh, misinformed as the children are and they can't they can't guide their children in the right path and when you talk about war when we send our troops overseas to get maimed when they come back they cannot be productive uh, it, it's unfortunate that they went it's unfortunate that they got killed don't get me wrong i'm not chastising them at all but then they become in fact a burden an added burden on society it seems that we we compound a compounded situation and we have this mentality that we could never go bankrupt uh, we're the richest nation in the world we're the most productive nation in the world in our own demented minds and and we're america that could never that could happen in zimbabwe it could never happen here because we're america and nothing could be further from the truth this it's a, a denial in you know, first think, degree think, uh, yeah it is denial and the cbo put out these long-term forecasts and they uh, they don't put out the fiscal gap calculation they haven't said publicly that the country has a 200 trillion dollar fiscal gap even though there's a bill before Congress called the Inform Act, which has been endorsed by over 1,200 of the uh, economists in the country, some of the very top economists in the country, including 17 Nobel Prize winners, have endorsed publicly the Inform Act, which would require the CBO and the OMB and the GB, G, uh, GAO to each do fiscal gap accounting. Now, that's not been supported by members of Congress because they don't want to tell the public the truth. So parents around the country haven't, don't know the truth because nobody's told them the truth. Um, if you go to the informact.org, T-H-E-I-N-F-O-R-M-A-C-T.org, you'll see all the endorsements of all these top economists. It's a who's who of economists in this country. Um, it's amazing, but, uh, but it's, you know, we in economics are saying, here's the way to measure the debt. We don't do Enron accounting. That's not what economics says to do. We do fiscal gap accounting, and on this basis, the country's dead broke, and don't make it worse. You, you got to fix this. And members of Congress have not voted in this legislation, even though it's a bi bipartisan bill. It hasn't been uh, enacted, and uh, so so it's outrageous. And when you say Zimbabwe, you know they've been running a hyperinflation to pay for their bills. Well, if you look at the Federal Reserve, what have they been doing since 2007? They printed right. Four over three trillion dollars right. worth of money right. to pay for the government's bills. So our, you know, the money creation has been astronomical. The the what's called a high powered money, the base money, monetary base was about eight hundred billion in, in two thousand and seven. It's now three point two trillion or so. So uh, actually, I think it's four trillion. It's, it's about a three trillion dollar increase. It's actually more than uh, yeah. maybe three point eight trillion. Uh, now. And the money supply itself has gone up. The M1 money supply has gone up by a factor of two, so it's doubled. Uh, now, we haven't seen prices take off, but they could. Uh, you know, the economy, at some point, uh, this will all catch up with the country in terms of higher prices, uh, and i.e. inflation, if not hyperinflation, because 
Right now, money is not moving around the country that rapidly, and the banks have been bribed by the Federal Reserve not to right. lend out a lot of the money that's been printed. But if we go back to where we were in 2007 in terms of what's called the money multiplier and the velocity of money, uh, we're going to end up with a, a price level that's three times higher than it is now. And if that happens, if the prices go up by a factor of three in a short period of time, that's what we call hyperinflation. Right. So to me, this whole idea of quantitative easing is just easing the burden on Congress to pay its bills. That's what quantitative easing is all about. I think it's um, another disgrace, another uh, problem that we're leaving for our children to deal with because uh, the country has this potential. Forget what the Fed's going to do in the future. Forget about their interest rate policy, which is really trivially unimportant. If you really think about it, whether they raise interest rates a quarter of a percentage point or not, who cares? It's not going to matter to the economy. Uh, but, or it shouldn't, unless people get panicked over it. The, but if you have this massive, massive amount of money that's been printed that can easily uh, raise the prices by a factor of three, uh, then in the context of people understanding that more money will have to be printed because the country is so broke, then you really are talking about Zimbabwe. Right. Then you are really are talking about uh, what's exactly what's needed to make a hyperinflation. Right. Uh, hyperinflation is always occur in countries that are broke, fiscally broke. Our country is fiscally broke beyond belief. And it's probably in, it could well be in worse shape than Greece. If you measure Greece's debt, right. if you mark Greece's debt to market, which they're not, haven't been doing this entire discussion about Greece having a debt to GDP ratio of 170% of GDP and our debt to GDP ratio, official debt is 70% of GDP. It's really not true because all the write downs that the Greeks have gotten from the uh, European Union have not been, and the Euro European Central Bank have not been included in the uh, mark and the valuation of the Greek debt because the Germans don't want to admit to the German people that the Greeks have actually uh, defaulted on uh, you know a good chunk about uh, of their debt and that the real debt to GDP ratio and if you're just talking about official debt not the fiscal gap but the official debt in Greece relative to its GDP if you market to market it's about 70% of GDP it's not, not much different than the US right so we have a social security system that's broke. We've got health care uh, programs that are uh, unaffordable that are going forward. Uh, Greece at least has some control over its health care spending. Uh, we, we don't have much control of that because it's, you know, my 96-year-old mom can go to 20 doctors and Medicare will pay all the bills. Uh, there's no limit to what the elderly can spend on themselves in the under the Medicare system. And we have... Uh, Senator Sanders saying that we should have Medicare for all. Uh, this is, you know, an invitation for the country to go bank or bankrupt even faster. Right. Well, not that I, you know, I I actually share a lot of his values and concerns. Uh, and I went to a, a talk to he gave the other night in Boston because uh, uh, my kids are all very excited by him and my wife is. But we have to be realistic about paying for our what we spend. We can't just right. uh, hope to give everybody more money and yeah, we can soak the rich more, but we should understand what the rich are paying already. And it turns out that the rich are paying a fair amount of money, uh, even the top 1%. So right. uh, we, we do need tax reform and we do need to have um, uh, more redistribution, but we have to do it in a way that's not that I leave the rich, leave the country and work somewhere else and uh, or have our companies leave the country, which is what they've been doing. So anyway, <laughs> well, it's a tricky situation. Oh, it, it is. Uh, when I, a, a retort that I received when when I discussed this the the, the debt issue, the, the the one response I received that's very very universal is um, that oh we're not really bankrupt because the United States is rich. We have natural resources. The government owns plenty of land, natural resources. Uh, we can sell those and easily pay all the debt off overnight. You know, I mean, virtually overnight. So really, if you look at our balance sheet, although we owe these hundreds of trillions of dollars, we have hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets that we could sell in order to pay off the debt. So we're really okay. 
Now, I've received that so many times, and I think that's an insane, you know, way of looking at things, but I would love to hear your response to that. Well, you know, if you look at the land that the government has, a lot of it is leased out, or some, you know, some portion of it is leased out where the government felt it could make some money doing that leasing or leasing oil uh, rights, okay. uh, uh, drilling rights. But if it isn't, le- if it isn't trying to exploit this, these lands, uh, these natural assets uh, commercially, then there's a reason for it. And the reason is that um, the country wants to preserve these uh, areas as wilderness or as, you know, uh, for environmental reasons. So the idea that we're not going to have to pay a price to take Yosemite National Park and sell it is absurd. You know, it's never going to happen. We're never going to sell Yosemite to anybody. Yeah. If we did sell it, we'd have to lease it back in order to provide it to the public. And that's just, you know, even if we privatize it, uh, we'd still need to lease it back from whoever bought it to um, to provide it to the public as a public service. Right. And the present value of those lease payments would probably ex- could well exceed the value we get for selling the thing. So if you do the fiscal gap accounting, you see very clearly a lot of these ideas just don't make any sense. For example, you could sell the White House. Oh, sure, that's an asset. Let's sell the White House, but where's the president going to live? You're going to have to lease it back, right. and therefore it's a wash. Yeah. Uh, okay, you get more revenue, uh, you know, one-time revenue, but the present value of the future expenditures is the same. So, uh, no, I don't think we have, uh, uh, if, if we had a lot of, uh, a huge chunk of gold that could, or, or, or some, uh, a very enormous resource. The Congress would be spending it uh, year, years ago to um, keep the official debt s- smaller, so they could look better and not have to raise ta- taxes or cut any spending. So, uh, so no, I don't think that the country is in a position to. Uh, it doesn't have some uh, extra hidden gold mine that um, nobody's heard about. Yeah. Well, I, and and much of the land that the government owns has very little or no commercial viability. So it, there would be very little interest in owning uh, thousands of acres of land of which there is no infrastructure at all, and um, there's, there's no population to support it, number one. And number two, if someone did buy it, most likely it would be a foreign interest, and we wouldn't sell it. Could you imagine if we took a good portion of the um, uh, Midwest and sold it all to China? I mean, that would never happen. So I always thought that that was uh, a pie in the sky, sounds good, you know, an excuse, you know, saying what we're not, it's a feel good excuse, it, but it has no, no practical uh, application whatsoever. Yeah, I think unfortunately that's the reality that um, we, there's just uh, no, no substitute for being fiscally prudent here. Right. We have to yeah. raise our taxes. We need to do it in a way that, uh, that uh, doesn't make the lives of the middle class and the poor worse. Because there has been a, uh, a, you know, we are losing the middle class, left, right, and center, through the whole process of, uh, I think, technological change, robots, uh, smart machines taking away people's jobs, also the competition from abroad, it's, uh, and the undereducation of, the, of our our children. So, yeah, we need we need to start fixing things. I have a series of proposals at the purpleplans.org, the purpleplans.org, which uh, people could take a look at. And I think that's a good platform for any member of anybody who's running for president right now could adopt these plans. They're all about a postcard length in terms of their um, details are not hard to understand. And they would fix uh, the tax system, the banking system, the healthcare system, the social security system. And the uh, and also produce uh, some help for the climate. So there are things that economists uh, uh, can suggest concretely uh, that would matter and would work, I, th- I think, for sure, and turn the economy around. But uh, they wouldn't necessarily be politically popular, uh, right? So, because people don't understand the the, the nature of the problem. Well, the politicians like to avoid pain because pain means loss of votes. If if you say, "Hey, the solution to this problem is for us to stop doing this," and then we can solve our problem and be forever better 
for, you know, and that your children will be better off. That person would never get elected. And I, you know, I heard a speech given by the symposium from uh, by Peter Schiff, and I th- he made such a, a a a comment that I think is at the heart of so many of our problems. He said, you know, the 2008 uh, crash was in fact not the problem. That was a solution. It. The, the economy crashed because it wanted to correct itself. It wanted to heal itself, and the Federal Reserve would not allow it, or the government would not allow the, gov- the, 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 the uh, economy to heal itself because in healing, there had to be some pain and suffering to go through that, but to come out better. So the, the, the banks were bailed out and all this, and it was like um, a fever. When, when you're very ill, you get a fever, and the fever is not your problem. The fever is, is trying to kill the infection in your body, and by getting rid of the fever, you may kill the patient. And this is exactly what we did. I thought that was an excellent anal- analogy. So they won't, there doesn't seem to be any tolerance for any pain at all, regardless of what the circuit, whatever the outcome m- may be. And, and t- to that vein, I would say we're in trouble. There, there is no way we're going to get out of this. It's only going to get worse. If you listen to the Republicans and the way they talk, they're talking about spending more money, not saving any more money. So I don't know where all this is going. I am, uh, I, I hate to say this, but I am very pessimistic as to where we are heading. I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel at all. Am, am I just a doomsday yeah, no, guy or what? <laughs> Help well, me. I'm going to have to run, but I think because uh, I have to get you and uh, go teach a class. But I think there are answers. Again, um, the PurplePlans.org provides answers. I think we have to protect ourselves personally. So again, I would recommend uh, get what's yours. The secret to maxing out your Social Security. That's a ten dollar or so book on Amazon or you can yes. go to the local bookstore, which I'd prefer you do. But also, there's this program, MaximizeMySocialSecurity.com, which uh, people can use to help themselves. Uh, to to do the get the higher benefits, for example, Joe, if you were to run it, you'd see exactly what um, okay. I'm saying. You and your wife should do at this point. So we have to uh, try and turn to some experts here who are not politicians, because the politicians have failed us. And I think it's time for economists to be listened to. Uh, that's I think the way to to go. So I think anybody listening to this uh, uh, program should go to one of these presidential rallies and ask the person who's running, have you read the purple plans? What do you think about this plan? What do you think about this plan? Because they're all very short. They're not uh, volumes, you know, they're 10 points each. Uh, Here's what we do to fix the problem. And they've been endorsed by Nobel laureates, these plans, many other economists. So they're not just my views. They're basically the economics profession's views. So I think there is an answer out there that economists can provide it's just we have to listen to to economists for a change. Which, yes. You know, because we're talking about the economy, so right. maybe we should look and listen to uh, the people actually have studied the issues. Right. So, anyway, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, and I um, hope we can do this again. Oh, thank you so much for being on our program. I know your time is very valuable, and we, we, do, we do look forward to hearing from you again. We'll, we will be in contact with you. Thank you so much for being on our show. My pleasure, Joe. Take thank care. You. All right, folks, this is the end of today's program. We'd like to thank our sponsors for the financial support, and we'd like to thank you for listening in. You can further the cause of liberty by recommending this program to your friends and let us hear from you. Our email address is comments at libertytalkradio.com. Remember, as my wife would say, you're either allowing your liberties to be taken away or you're striving to protect them. Unfortunately, there is no middle ground. Until next time, this is Joe Cristiano. You've been listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Stay well. Stay tuned.